नमस्कार एंड गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल ऑफ यू डू यू हेयर मी समथिंग स्टिल रॉन्ग विथ माई थ्रोट प्लीज टेक केयर दैट देर इज नो ए सी थैंक यू सो लास्ट लेक्चर टूडे एंड आई मस्ट थैंक यू ऑल बिफोर आई बिगिन फॉर आस्किंग मी क्वेश्चन बेसिकली लेट मी शेयर वन fact with you very frankly and that is this is the first time that i have i have met an audience who is so inquisitive so sincere so attentive so big hand for the audience how would you like even in to, even in pune i never uh, met any audience like this would you like to start with devadatta you asked me to remind ah uh, devadatta maybe at the end because uh, my commitment is with this so i'll finish it perhaps maybe quickly <laughs> uh, most of the part of uh, today's presentation will be reading out references apart from the first two which are going to be rather tough uh yeah <clears throat> so yesterday we uh, failed to discuss about this information ch uh, chaining which is one of the major techniques used by pandani to achieve uh, an effective meta language and i i i think i don't need to explain what meta language is it's a language describing a language and it's a specially developed language for describing a language and therefore pandani developed technical terminology he developed uh, code language he developed uh, sutra style though it was uh, handed down to him earlier but he made a lot of reforms in that and he tried to make it more and more succinct and pithy and he reduced it to just uh, four word and he reduced it to a kind of algebraic formula and you have to keep in mind that pandani's meta language consists of just one type of sentence whichever sutra you read it is just the whole ashtadhyayi is just one type of sentence there are several types of sentences in sanskrit i am i will come to that also little later how many types of sentences pandini has discussed in his grammar but as far as his meta language is concerned it is just one type of sentence a is b and nothing beyond that he gives at the most one condition environment and some kind of a modifier like va cho optionally uh, comp obligatorily something like that or maybe he mentions when in which condition sometimes he gives meaning condition in that particular sense and all that so we come to this information chaining though the word sounds a little awkward is nothing but ellipsis i again use a, a metaphor <laughs> but this time it's a metaphor of a garland you know the meaning of sutra itself is thread so just as flowers are strewn in a thread or pearls are strewn in a thre thread all the sutras actually uh, sutra is not a proper word for pandani's formulae ashtadhyayi itself is a long sutra the text of the ashtadhyayi is a thread in which all these 3994 formulae are strewn together and just as we cannot remove any flower and uh, place it at a different place in the same manner we cannot remove any sutra in pandani's grammar and place it at a different place it is very difficult to remove a flower from a garland just take it out and put it at some other place no because they are fixed so for each and every sutra the previous it is linked with the previous as well as the next sutra so there is a continuous chain and what is being chained is information and what is this information is the content the content of the previous sutra is being continued in the next sutra it is being further continued in the next sutra as long as it is required to complete the statement there is this condition so here what we find 
is a set of rules which explain the technical term it. Yesterday we did not deal with this, but this is an artificial technical term. And this technical term simply means anubandha, code letter. It's a Paninian term. Panini has defined it as it. Later grammatical tradition calls it anubandha. And in our modern, maybe linguistic or just normal terminology, we call it a code letter. It is a code letter because it conveys some meaning as a as in code language, a code word conveys some meaning, but it is suggested, it is not directly stated. And when after that meaning is suggested, that letter, the function of that letter is no more there. And therefore, I compared it with traffic light, as you remember. So here, in this set, we have three words in the first sutra, upadeshe, and aj, or four actually, upadeshe, ach, anunasika, it. And what continues is the word Upadesha. Upadesha is a technical term. I don't want to go into the details of all the meanings of this term, but for the for the for this class, for the purpose of this class, I say Upadesha is Pandini's Ashtadhyay. The original pronunciation of the teacher, that is Upadesha. So in this text, Pandini refers to his own text. He says Upadesha, that means in my Ashtadhyayi, in my text, Anunasika Aj is called it. So whenever you find in my text a nasal vowel, it is it. And what is the function of the it? The function is the same as the traffic light. It will indicate something and it will disappear. Then the next uh, uh, set of say four, five, six sutras, the word Upadeshe continues. This is information chaining. And this is called Anuvrutti. In the following sutras, the word Upadeshe is required to complete the meaning of the statement. Upadeshe hal antyam it. So in Ashtadhyayi, antyam hal means the final consonant is called it. And then Navibhakta Utusma and this, this is, you don't bother about the meaning of this. But what is important for us to understand is that the word Upadeshe and then from the fourth rule onwards, the word Adi also is continued. It is continued because if we don't continue it, the meaning is incomplete. And another rule is you continue all content from the previous sutra as long as it doesn't go contrary to the statement. It, it, as long as it is not incompatible with the statement of the following sutra. So Upadeshe just comes, fa falls down like raindrops. These words, they fall down like raindrops till they are blocked by some other word. There is some other word which is incompatible and then they are, they are stopped there. They are blocked. So Anuvritti also is blocked by another word which says, no, no, this is my chair. You cannot sit in this chair. The Supadesha stops there. Similarly, Adi is required in all these sutras, and therefore I put them in the, into the bracket to show that they are the required information which is being chained, which is being continued there. So in other words, you can say that they are kind of a common factor. So Pandini has first of all formulated the rules and then he found that there is some common factor and then he puts one rule at the head and that common factor he completely drops from the text of the following rules which saves the text of the sutra. So this is how he achieves his much uh, awaited or his much required goal that is economy. He is a champion of brevity, they say. Brevity is the soul of his. Uh, there is a big controversy among the Western scholars. Um, when they study Ashtadhyay, they say whether brevity was the aim or it was the means. And they go on fighting, let, let them fight uh, on that. We were not concerned with that. But uh, for us, it is a means. And sometimes, you know, means and goal, they are so close together. It doesn't matter. You call it a means or a goal. 
But uh, here you will find that uh, the common factor is simply deleted later on. It is deleted in order to save the length of the sutra. So Adi also is deleted. And now, uh, this whole exercise, which shows that there is some kind of similarity with the mathematical function known as factorization. A scholar has done this, and I have borrowed from <laughs> borrowed all these things from uh, from an article of one of my senior colleagues. It is already published there, so it's not my exercise, but it is very easy to make exercise like this. So just you put the symbols x, y, p, q, etc., etc. Let us not dwell upon this. You can do it even at home, and then comes you can come up with this formula x, y into bracket a plus b plus c plus p, etc., etc. That you can do, you, maybe if uh, the organizers allow, you can take a picture and do it at home and find um, great delight, <laughs> happiness that you have been able to solve it. So this procedure of anuvritti or information chaining, chaining can be compared with the math math mathematical procedure of factorization. So actually, where are we driving? We are driving at our goal to show that Parnini was a mathematician. Or at least he was very well acquainted with mathematics, and he used the basic mathematics for his <laughs> language analysis. And therefore, this uh, example. Another illustration, next. Another illustration is that of linguistic zero. Uh, quite a few scholars have uh, claimed that in India, linguistic zero preceded mathematical zero. So it is the Panini zero which came first, it influenced mathematics, and in mathematics zero was introduced later on. We really don't know who is right and whether it is uh, the claim is correct. <coughs> but anyway, Panini does give us something which is similar to zero. So I give you an example of a finished form, He Devo. He Devo is a vocative of Devo. You know vocative, Sambodhana. Oh God. How to derive this form, He Devo? So there is this Pratipadika Devo, and there is no separate case ending for vocative. The same case ending as meant for Prathama is added to vocative, and then it is zeroed. It is, for zero, Panini uses the term lope. Lope is disappearance. It completely disappears. Just as Anubandha disappears. Similarly, this disappears. There is a lope. Then there are actually four kinds of zero in Panini's grammar. Again, let's not go into those complexities. And each one of them has a special function to perform. I chose one, only one for uh, today's class, and that is LOPA. And the function of LOPA is that even after deletion, the suffix which is deleted performs its role or performs its function. What is the function of that uh, uh, suffix which is deleted? The suffix which is deleted is SU. It conveys vocative. It is in the vocative sense. So even after the deletion of Su, the meaning Deva contains that meaning vocative. And therefore, we say Deva stands for O God. It is not just a Pratipadika. Otherwise, Deva is a Pratipadika, we know. But when Deva is used as a finished word, there is some additional meaning. And that additional meaning is vocative. So, Lopa contributes to add the desired meaning to the stem before disappearing. So, it has a positive value and therefore they say this is a positive zero. Just as in mathematics we have positive value for zero and negative value for zero. Similarly here, Manini talks about this zero which has a positive value. 
more positive meaning you will understand in the next example and here we have a vocative from hari hari is another pratipadika and the vocative is hare hare maam pahi maam trahi etc etc so again the same procedure but there is an additional change you will find in deva there is no change at all the pratipadika remains the same with the addition of the meaning vocative but here there is a change in the form of the stem hari becomes hare and how does it happen when the vocative ending is added to the pratipadika ending in e that e undergoes the procedure called guna we saw yesterday guna and guna means e becomes a so it becomes hare here so this is in short the function of zero in pandanis grammar and there are several other functions uh, actually only on zero we can have a full length lecture <laughs> and so many examples are there but it this is just again to point out that there is something which can be compared to mathematics in pandanis grammar and zero is again regarded as one of the greatest achievements of pandani because before that nobody was actually aware of this kind of function add the suffix delete it but at the same time retain the function of the suffix the suffix hands over the function to the stem and then disappears this is the function performed by zero through zero you can see uh now this inbuilt decoding mechanism uh, i talked about it uh, in maybe yesterday's or day before yesterday's class and i told you that pandini himself has given the decoding mechanism in his uh, ashtadhyayi and here we have one sutra adihi antyana sahita about which i talked to you yesterday i remember which gives you the procedure of arriving at the abbreviation such as ak and i think yesterday we i explained all these things if you remember adi a for instance here o is adi and antya it na ka ng and ch the final vowels uh, final consonants they are all its they are all anubandhas added and their function is only to form pratyaharas form abbreviations they are meant for abbreviations that's all they don't have any other purpose to serve as far as this 14 sutra is concerned in other places anubandhas have many many other functions about 30 40 functions have been assigned to anubandhas by pandani and there is a <coughs> very nice book on anubandhas of pandani by one of my senior colleagues in pune uh, so we have <coughs> abbreviation ak then ang and then ach and all these abbreviations for all these abbreviations pandani gives <coughs> the decoding mechanism in the rule adhi antena sah ita antena ita sah adhi and we have to understand madhyaganam saudnya bhavati the initial along with the final it speaks of the intermediate vowels so this is how we arrive at abbreviations and pandini already gives you this sutra in his ashtadhyayi which tells you how to form pratyaharas but again adhirantena sahita is not very easily intelligible to an ordinary sanskritist you need a guru actually for understanding pandini ashtadhyayi you certainly need guru if not pandini pandini must not have been available <laughs> or he must have been available only for the first shishyas but then the tradition continued similarly there is there are two more decoding sutras shashti sthane yoga and tasmin niti nirdishte purvascha we come to the example and then i explain to you the sutras the example is the same as we saw yesterday eko yan achi and we interpreted this as ikaha as i told you is a genitive singular so ikaha does not mean 
as it means in ordinary Sanskrit, Shasti just means off. What is the meaning of Deva Sya in Sanskrit? Of Deva. But here it, does, it doesn't mean off in Pani. It is a metalinguistic case, Shasti. Shasti, Saptami, Panchami, they, are, they have to perform some metalinguistic function. So here, what is the meaning of Shasti? Pandini has given in the rule. Shasti, Sthane, Yoga. Shasti, the genitive ending added to a word in my sutra should be understood as connecting that word with the word Sthane. So, Ikaha means Ikaha, Sthane. And what does it mean? In place of Ik. So something is going to happen in place of ik, which means that ik is going to disappear and something else is coming in its place. And what is that? Ikasthane yan. So e becomes yo, u becomes wo, as we saw yesterday. And therefore, the example nadi atra. And when it uh, when e becomes yo, achi. So what is the meaning of achi? Again, achi is a locative of ach. The ordinary meaning of locative in Sanskrit language is either on or in or within or in subject of something like this. But in this case, this is a metalinguistic case and therefore the meaning is specific. It means achi parataha. So when ach follows, when ach follows, the immediately preceding word changes into something. So here in case of nadi atra, ach of atra follows e of nadi. So here we have a situation where these two paribhashas, these two decoding, they are called paribhasha technically. So these two decoding rules, they are applied and we arrive at the meaning ikaha, sthane, yan, achi, Parataha Purvasya. So, Ach must be following and Ik must be preceding. Purvasya Ikaha. Kasya Purvasya, Acha Purvasya. Ach must be following and Ik must be preceding. Then only E changes into Ya. This is the meaning. So, we have two words here added by these two Paribhashas, Sthane and Parataha. And there are many other rules uh, or many other paribhashas, I should say, which give this decoding technique in Pandanese grammar. <coughs> now let us talk about, I, 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 it, it is just a repetition, but I thought I should once again, uh, because I wanted to, something, wanted to say something more. <laughs> so I brought in the whole thing again. Uh, descriptive technique, simply means derivation and that is, you know, Parnini's linguistic atomism. Modern linguists describe it as Parnini's linguistic atomism because it is con confined to the language, this atomism. And why atomism? Because Parnini has reached the atoms of the language. And these atoms, uh, you refer to phonemes, uh, I think day before. So let me clear. Uh, here that there are two kinds of atoms which are arrived at by Pandini on two different levels. On phonetic level, he arrives at basic vowels and consonants. So they are phonetic atoms, you can say. And then on morphemic level, on morphemic level, that is on the level of meaningful speech units. A morpheme is a meaningful speech unit. It conveys some meaning. So on morphemic level, there are prakruti and pratyaya. And prakruti and pratyaya need not necessarily be single phonemes. They are sometimes just single phonemes. For instance, there are quite a few roots in the ashtadhyayi which are just single phonemes, e, etc. So they are single phonemes, but not often. And therefore, prakruti and pratyaya are kind of you know clusters of phonemes. But these clusters they have their own meanings. That is not the case with phonemes o, e, u, rulu, a, o, i, o, as we saw in the alphabetic table which uh, is there at the very beginning of the Ashtadhyayi. 
and this reminds me of a controversy even among the Parninian scholars. I mean, traditional Parninian followers. The next uh, to Parnini was Katyayana, and next to Karnini, Parnini, uh, Katyayana was Patanjali. And in Patanjali's big voluminous work, which is known as Mahabharsha, it has 85 chapters. And uh, actually, uh, a student ha only has to aspire for finishing the text in his one lifetime. Such a huge text. And actually, it makes a very pleasant reading. It's a very pleasant prose. Because Patanjali, uh, as if teaches, there is a classroom, and there are students sitting. And he, is, talks, he talks to you, and he cuts jokes, and he talks to a student who is very naughty, uh, because it's a kind of a question-answer text. It's a dialogue. And therefore, it uh, makes a very interesting reading. Though sometimes there is some philosophy and uh, some other things are there. So Patanjali raises this question whether phonemes are meaningful or not. Varnaha anarthakaha va nava. Whether phonemes have any meaning in language. And finally, he comes to the conclusion that anarthakaha varnaha. But he gives his own reasons. He says, there are groups of words like koop, yup, soup. Now they appear to be having something similar. Koop, yup, and soup, they have oop similar. So two phonemes similar in all the three, but do they have any similarity of meaning? What does koop mean? Well, soup means soup in modern <laughs> English terminology. And yup means a post. So there is no corresponding meaning similarity, even if the phonemes are similar. And therefore, he rules out the possibility of any phoneme being meaningful. And finally, they, it is established that phonemes by themselves are totally meaningless. So this is how gone. <laughs> Unfortunately for Panini. <laughs> so these are the two levels. This is what I wanted to point out. So Prakriti and Pratyaya is further split into Varna, 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 that is phoneme, phoneme, phoneme. That is a Prakriti like say Rama is split into R, A, M, A, four letter word. So that is uh, on phonetic level. But this is Panini's linguistic atomism. <coughs> Now, this is something very interesting, and I must explain it to you. All sentences, why, are, why we call it atomism? All sentences in Sanskrit are reduced to 540 archetypal sentences. This is great contribution of this grammarian, very hardly recognized so far by linguists. Panini has collected all the sentences, infinite number of sentences in Sanskrit. His uh, workshop is rich with sentences in Sanskrit. Uh, everything in literature, right from Vedas to his time. Not only literature, spoken language, because he toiled hard for 12 years, they say, in just collecting raw material. And then all these sentences he analyzed, and then he found that they say there is a verbal root, there is a nominal root, so you can make a group of verbal roots, you can make a group of nominal roots, and then for verbal roots, you can have a group of just 18 verbal endings. As we saw yesterday, 21 nominal endings, deriving all the forms, finished words in Sanskrit. Just 21. But how many words they derive? Infinite number of words. You take any noun, Add any one of them, you get the finished word. So these 21 nominal endings are also archetypal atomic suffixes. Similarly, 18 verbal endings are also archetypal atomic suffixes. Similarly, he classifies all the tenses and moods, Vartamana, Bhuta, and Bhavishya. In Sanskrit, Vartamana is one. But Bhuta is divided into three, Bhavishya is divided into four. 
So these are the tenses. And then there are moods, <coughs> imperative, optative, and so on and so forth. Again, within optative, there are two different kinds. So all these together, they form 10 sets of, that is called lakaras. Lat, lit, lut, lut, let, float, lung, ling, lung, ru. They are 10 lakaras. Each one of them stands for one tense or one mood. So take any verb, for instance, add all the verbal endings. I mean, we are now trying to count how many sentences or sentence types are derived by Pandini. A verb multiplied by 18 verbal endings multiplied by 10 different sets of uh, tense and mood markers. And yes, there are three voices in Sanskrit, active, passive, and medial, or medio-passive. You, you must be having it also in Kannada, because we have it in Marathi. We call it Kartari, Karmani, and Bhave. Do you have something similar in Kannada? Kartari, Karmani, and Bhave. Be the master class in that. Hmm? Be the master class in that. <laughs> but, but it should not be confined to just three lectures. You cannot achieve anything. Anyway, so for instance, Ramaha Gramam Gachati, the same old example we saw yesterday, is a Kartari because it is the Karta who is prominent there. Active. Yes, it is active. Then, Ramena Gramaha Gamyate, it is passive. And Ramena Gamyate, there is no uh, karman, there is no object. Not intended by speaker. Speaker's intention carries a lot of meaning in Pandit's grammar. If I don't want to mention karma, it is my own desire. And Pandini agrees to that. He says, yes, if you don't want to say use karman, then it becomes passive. That's all. So three voices. So one verb multiplied by 10 tense markers, multiplied by 18 verbal endings, multiplied by three voices. How many? 540. So all sentences are reduced to only 540 sentence types. You take any sentence in Sanskrit, it will be fitted into one of these categories. That's all. This is again another example of Pandani's atomism. So everything is reduced to basic atoms. Similarly, we saw all nominal forms reduced to 21 <coughs> archetypal. So this archetypal suffixation, archetypal uh, nominal stems, verbal stems, is one of the greatest contributions of Pandini. <clears throat> and now we come to today's Pandini machine. But I am sure whatever we saw during the two uh, sessions, yesterday and day before, some vague idea must have appeared in, my, in your mind that Pandini's grammar is something similar to a machine. Because he derives something from, derive, uh, from uh, basic elements. So this is an imaginary <laughs> picture of Pandini machine. On the input side, we have the complete text of Ashtadhyayi. That means the rules, they are fed to a computer. You know, computer also needs some kind of rules to operate. Then the whole raw material data in the form of nominal stems and verbal roots, that is fed. And then we have to select what we want to say. So we, want, we select the word Rama, we want to make a Rama Karta. We want to select uh, the root Gama, because there are 200 roots in Sanskrit which convey the meaning Gama. But we want to convey that meaning by means of the root Gama. So this is our selection. It is speaker's selection of the proper words. Not words, actually, basic units, speech units. And then grammar is going to be the object. So after this selection and after uh, every other thing, what the speaker wants to say. For instance, later uh, grammarians have tried to 
break the meaning of a complete sentence into small parts of meanings. For instance, what does Rama convey? Rama conveys a name, this much we know. Ramaha, for instance, Ramaha Gramam Gachati. How many meanings do you understand from the sentence Ramaha Gramam Gachati? You will say Rama, Gramo, and Gama. No. Rama, Ramaha conveys the name of the person, his gender. Masculinity, his being in the present tense, Vartamana, and his being a Kartru. So, in uh, the later technical terminology, they will say Ekatva Vachinna, Vartamana Kal Tat Kalatva Vachinna, Punstva Vachinna, Rama Bhida Karta, or Kartrutva Vachinna. This Avachinna thing comes from Nyaya Shastra. So, so many meanings, four meanings from Rama. Similarly, four meanings from Grama and also from Gachati or Gama plus T, you understand Gama. Gama has been analyzed into, can you tell me? Here, here is my student sitting. <laughs> hmm? Purva Pada Vibhaga Janya Uttara Pada Prakshepanadi Vyaparaha. When you walk, what you do? The one leg you keep above and the front leg you put. So this is the moment and therefore they have analyzed all such meanings. Similarly, Patati, uh, Uttara Desha Vibhaga Janya Pur Adho Desha Sanyoga Nukulaha Vyaparaha. Phalam Bruksha Patati, a fruit is falling down from a tree. What is the meaning of Patati? From the Uttara Desha, from the above region, there is a vibhaga, there is a separation of the phala. And it is connected with adhodesha. Unless the sanyoga is there, the uh, action of pato is not complete. So adhodesha vibhaga anukula vyapara. So this is how they analyze complete meanings. So several meanings are understood by one sentence. You will find out. And ti also conveys ekatva, kartrutva, Vartamana, all these things are conveyed by ti. Uh, this was a kind of a detour. <laughs> and then uh, when all these selected items, when they enter into the machine, which we call Pandini machine, which already is, uh, they are equipped with Pandini's rules, then the operation begins, then the prakriya begins. And after that prakriya, we get the word, uh, the expression Ramo Gramam Gachati. And something very significant of which I made a mention yesterday is that each one of the words in this sentence, they, unless they are connected with each other, they are not produced. Panini never, Panini machine does not produce Ramaha, separate word, Gramam, separate word, and Gachati, separate and then somebody comes up and connects it. No. Pandini gives you a ready-made sentence. That is his achievement. So, therefore, I said yesterday that it is a Vakyanushasana. Although tradition calls it a Shabdanushasana. Pandini's grammar does not derive only words, although it appears to be so. Through words, the final product is always the sentence. And that sentence structure is already there in his mind. And then he proceeds further. In order to decide which case the word Rama is going to take, the, it, it all depends upon the verbal ending. Whether the verbal ending is going to convey karta or karman or act, just action. Accordingly, the case ending will be decided. So this is how they are mutually connected. And the end result is a chain of meaningfully connected words, that is a sentence. So this is, in a very short, uh, the concept of Pandini machine, which I placed before you. I didn't actually mean to make it more complex, 
it can be <laughs> made by giving you a very complex prakriyas, how they operate, uh, etc., etc. And now there are some quotes about Pandini and computer. But now yeah, we, you must have got uh, some idea that Pandini can, there is a possibility that Pandini can be compared to a computer because there is some kind of input and there is another kind of output and there is certainly something which we can call Pandini machine. So put it, and uh, yes, there have been attempts to computerize Pandini and they are still going on. So there is uh, this first one is by Rick Briggs. Among the accomplishments of Sanskrit grammarians can be reckoned a method of paraphrasing Sanskrit in a manner that is identical not only in essence but in form and current work of artificial intelligence. So Pandini's grammar is straight away connected with artificial intelligence by Rick Briggs. So it is tempting to think of them, them means these ancient grammarians, as computer scientists without hardware. They didn't have any hardware, but they were computer scientists. The brain itself was their hardware. Now about Rick Briggs, you might be having an idea who Rick Briggs was. He was a NASA scientist and he came upon this ancient Sanskrit grammatical tradition and then he found out how a sentence is broken into different meanings and then he, he was wondering whether this can be put into machine and he tried to experiment with machine translation of one language into another through some interface. And he said this Sanskrit paraphrasing method can certainly work as an interface. This is how he compares. And it is Rick Briggs who did this, uh, made this statement in 1985 in uh, AI magazine, Artificial Intelligence. And this triggered the whole dialogue or debate or whatever you call it about Pandini and computer later on. And therefore, uh, I thought I should point out to you the very first statement regarding comparison of Pandini with computer. And then there came uh, a series of uh, linguists and scholars who talked about Pandini machine or Pandini uh, uh, Ashtadhyay as a computer. Ashtadhyay was not a device to create some school sentences. We have seen it on the very first day. But it was an iconic representation of sacred language. And what does this icon consist of? a computational structure. So Sharfe is a Western linguist. So as soon as he studied Pandini, he said that I started visualizing an icon. The whole language is put up in a kind of an icon. And this icon is a computation, you know, structure. Actually, all credit goes to Pandini for making Sanskrit, Sanskrito. Sanskrit is a refined language. So Sanskrit got this shape and form and beauty and everything because of Pandini's analysis. That is precisely why computer experts are keen to computerize it. And he further uh, <coughs> describes Pandini's grammar as something less than a well-oiled machine. What is lacking in Ashtadhyayi is oiling. In, in other machines you have to <laughs> give oil to them, you don't need to give any oil to Pandini machine. So that is the difference, he says. And then comes uh, another, uh, a very recent uh, quote. Pandini is, a spoke, uh, is to spoken Sanskrit as Turing and other early logicians are to modern mathematics and early formalisms. So Turing machine, I think you are uh, quite aware of those who are working in computers particularly, they know what it is. During, uh, <clears throat> in 1936, he was a computer, uh, he was not a computerist, he, com he was a pioneer in uh, giving this concept of computer. But he developed a machine in 1936 for the uh, British uh, intelligence service. They employed him. Hmm? Yes. And uh, the, it's for World War II, to decoding the messages of the Germans in order to find out when and where they are going to bomb. And they had a suspicion that Germans, they have already prepared atom bomb. 
and therefore they started all these things. So Turing was the first to generate this kind of a, a mechanism, and therefore he is known as uh, the father of modern computer. There is a very beautiful uh, movie, yes, biopic one, and it's uh, he, he actually met with a very sad death. Uh, yes, you you should watch it. I watched it and. I, I really felt very sad about uh, Turing. Such a great uh, person, a great scientist. They say he, his machine was able to save 14 million lives because he, he could stop the world war from moving further by decoding German messages. Such a great uh, job he did for the whole humanity during that period. But finally, he was put into jail because they found him to be a homosexual. That was considered as his crime, his offense. And there he finally committed suicide. Anyway, poor fellow. <clears throat> so Turing came up with a mechanistic uh, model of computing and his proposal, how to compare Turing with uh, Pandini. So, Turing's proposal was a minimal set of five actions that a person needs to carry out computing. So he reduced all the actions which a person is needed to uh, go on computing into five actions. He said these actions could be performed without human intervention. Just put, put them in some code uh, mechanism and you can arrive at this. So Turing is credited with the notion of algorithm and Pandini's grammar also is described as the first algorithm that was ever created in this world. Pandini also gave an algorithmic model. <coughs> so Pandini's order system of rules also corresponds with the concept of algorithm. That is a procedure that generates result with a finite set of rules. So what is an algorithm? A finite set of rules deriving infinite number of products. And therefore, Pandini's grammar also is a finite set of rules deriving infinite number of sentences. Uh, <coughs> is this the end? Uh, no, the, 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 there is next. Uh, yeah. Uh, I found some information on uh, internet regarding Pandini's comparison with modern scientists and computer uh, uh, scientists. And therefore, I thought I should share it with you. So there is another comparison with uh, bacchus nor form. And there is a scholar, T.N. T.R. N. Rao, who says, bacchus nor form should be truly called Pandini bacchus form. Because uh, he is an Indian, and he thought, instead of calling it bacchus nor form, why don't you introduce the name of Pandini here? because it is actually the Pandinian form. Bacchus actually found it later on. But long ago, 2500 years ago, Pandini actually discovered it. So Pandini should be given credit. Yesterday also I shed tears on <laughs> the fact that Pandini's name is absent in that uh, booklet. Perhaps because Pandini is hardly being studied these days. And that is mainly because his uh, tiger-like structure of his grammar. They just want to run away. So Bacchus nor form is described as a notation. It is a notation. It is a meta syntax notation for the context-free grammars which are often used to describe the syntax of languages used in computing. So again, it's, it's a kind of a notation giving you the meta syntax. Panini gives again you the meta theory, not just meta syntax. It gives you meta theory. So it is a formal structure, bacchus nor form. Perhaps I am uh, telling you something which you, most of you already know. Uh, if that is the case, uh, yeah, please excuse me and think that it is just brushing up your memory. <coughs> so it is a formal structure for a computer program suitable for expressing a large class of numerical processes in a concise form for a direct automatic translation. So automation, conciseness, they all which are found in Bacchus nor form, they are also found in Pandini. And therefore, there is a very striking similarity between the two. And therefore, many scholars compare it with 
uh, compare the two together. Now, uh, there is another quote from uh, D.D. Mahulkar, a very well-known linguist from Baroda. Uh, actually, Panini and Euclid, they have been a subject of uh, discussion among many, many scholars. <laughs> Panini and Euclid are being often compared to each other, and there is a very, very transparent possibility of comparison between the two. I have just picked up one or two uh, quotes for your understanding. So Euclid's formalism had a mathematical basis, whereas Panini's formalism had an empirical basis. So Panini's formalism was something very unique. It was directly connected with human behavior. Whereas Euclid was still in the world of numbers and abstract world, but Panini was concerned with actual human behavior. Herein lies the difference. <coughs> so, points of similarity between Euclid and Panini, both are ancient thinkers. Euclid belonged to uh, around the period around 300 centuries BC, Panini 500. BC or even earlier, both exercise a great influence on the later development of scientific thinking. You will find Euclid uh, is credited with giving a foundation to whole European scientific thought, whereas Panini is credited with uh, giving the same foundation for Indian scientific thought. <coughs> both constructed a complete system by means of a precise method. So precision is something which is common to both of them. Then Euclid's 13 books which are called Elements uh, and Panini's book is simply called Sutra. Uh, while their method and uh, their technique show great similarities of contents on which they were working, uh, the contents are different, but technique and method they are quite similar. And uh, we have already read um, out uh, Didi Mahulkar's quote. There are many things uh, which can be talked about uh, Euclid and Panini, but it is not necessary actually in this class. Uh, so we have seen Panini as a mathematician to some extent, Panini as a computer <laughs> scientist to some extent. Uh, so. Uh, in all the three, Panini's grammar, computer, and mathematics, economy or brevity matters most. That is the point of similarity among all the three. All the three consist in a finite set of rules deriving infinite number of products. Use of symbolic language is yet another point of similarity among all the three. So this is about Panini, Euclid, Bacchus norm, and what else? Much more. Therefore, summary, Panini the greatest intellectual, Panini is credited with giving to the world for the first time, you have to remember, for the first time, formalism, that is linguistic atomism, and as I said, Sanskrit is Sanskrita, because of Panini. <clears throat> yes, one thing I forgot to mention and now I come to Devadatta because I may forget later <laughs> here. Panini made use of every single aspect of speech units while discussing the meaning of the sentence. As we saw, Ramaha is analyze further into singularity, masculinity, and present, etc., etc. Similarly, he looked into the tone and accent. And he very closely observed, kind of, you know, he deeply pierced into human behavior and tried to find out if some sentences, if not all, they really have an undertone of some feelings and attitudes. And yes, they do have. They are not always dry sentences. Say, for instance, this word Devadatta. What is the meaning of Devadatta? You all know Deva and Datta. So, 
Some people very fondly uh, give the, this name to their child, Devadatta, because they, are, uh, they have a faith in God, and they say, yes, we wanted a son, we got a son, therefore we say he is given by the God. But that is not the only meaning of Devadatta according to Panini. Panini says, Devadatta conveys that it is a blessing from the God. Somebody approached the God with a desire to have a son. How do you call it? Manauti in Hindi, isn't it? Mannat, mannat. But what is the word in English? I don't know. <laughs> English, we don't have <laughs> this kind of thing. In Marathi, we have navas. There is any Marathi. Navas, navas. So it means that the person, uh, from the bottom of his heart, he re really wants to have a son. Therefore, he worships God and says, God, give me a son as a blessing. And if it comes as a blessing, then you call it Devadatta. So this is a hid hidden meaning. This is what Pandini has observed. Deva enam deya suhu. Let, may the gods give to me. This is the undertone. But <clears throat> that is not enough. He has also analyzed accents. And I give you just one example. You are already acquainted with the word, word bratruvya. Bratruvya is a word which is derived from bratru, which means brother. And bratruvya etymologically means the son of the brother. That is a nephew, isn't it? Son of the son of the brother is a nephew. But Panini adds one more thing, and that has a very, uh, very interesting cultural uh, suggestion. He says, if the word Vratruvya is accented on the final syllable, it's not accent; it is Svarito. On the final syllable, then it means enemy. So, does it mean that in ancient times also? There was enmity among brothers. We call it Bhratrukalaha. And kin kaire mantat kaitari mant bhau bandki. So do you have it in Kannad? I don't know. But two brothers and their children, there is always a kind of a fight regarding property, succession, and all that. So that must have existed. So Panini actually distinguished these two meanings on the basis of accent. That is his greatness. And there are hundreds of such examples. Uh, he refers to contempt, he refers to happiness, he refers to praise. And uh, at least, you know, I have classified 16 different meanings, which are emotional meanings, attitudinal meanings, which he attaches to some, either to accent or tone or to a part of a suffix. But he does give it, and it, it is a unique feature of Pandani Dashkade. I haven't come across any grammar of any language which also talks about emotions. Language, I think they have asked you to ask question at the end because it is being, it is being video recorded. So you can ask it, and you will also show yourself on the video. <laughs> on the video. <laughs> so sophisticated meta language we have already seen. Foundation of scientific thinking. This is just a summary. Uh, comprehensive treatment of spoken language. And when I say comprehensive, what I mean is that it is not the language spoken in the region where he lived, but he also dealt with variations in the language which was being spoken in the region on the north of the place where he was staying. And he says, Uttare. He says, in the north, this kind of variation, and also in the East. So much comprehensive was his treatment. Then mathematical model, we have seen some part of it for encapsulating essentials of a knowledge discipline. And it, he gave you for the first time a model of phonetic analysis of a language, although it existed in treatises like Shiksha and Pratishakya, which existed before. <clears throat> so, in fact, fact uh, it was a model of perfect grammar, and therefore there is a quote from which I haven't given here. 
uh, another very recent scientist and historian. He says it seems surprising that Panini's 2500 year old formalism is closer to the structure of language than Chomsky's transformational formalism. This is how he compares the two. So with this, uh, I end my own presentation and I would be very happy to get questions from you. I remember one question from Pratiti ji last uh, yesterday. You put it to me and I said I will answer it publicly. <laughs> you remember that? I remember the question. And the question was, in which script did Panini write? Very difficult question. But it generally be believed that all knowledge was orally transmit transmitted because script was not yet being used for writing down during that period. Scri script came very late. So it is, it is claimed that Panini did not use any script. It was just in his brain. The whole structure, the whole architect of the language, the big mansion of the language with his analysis and synthesis and all that. And not only Panini, his followers did the same. Until his grammar and other grammars, they were put to writing. But that came late, around the first century maybe. We have records that uh, writing <coughs> in India, they, it started in the beginning of the common era. We don't have any records earlier. Or, of course, Ashoka's uh, inscriptions are there and they belong to pretty early period. But we don't have manuscripts, at least not in Pandini's time. So maybe I would like to have more questions uh, and I will try to answer them while sitting, if you allow me. <laughs> just as a follow up to what you just mentioned. Okay. Um, so Devanagari, which is what we're reading all this in, did not exist at the time, for sure. Sorry, I could not get it. Devanagari, Devanagari yeah. definitely did not exist at the time. No. Yeah. Brahmi was, was the first script. Sorry? Brahmi. Brahmi. So was there some form of Brahmi in existence at that time? Yes, yes, there was. But we really don't know whether Pandini used it. We don't have any record of that. But Brahmi was uh, certainly being used. Uh, Northwestern part of India, beyond Himalayas, they have found some records. And even uh, Ashokan uh, inscriptions. Yes. Yeah. My question is, if uh, Patanjali came after Panini, then uh, Patanjali is credited with describing the Navarasas and then, Navarasas? you know. Well, isn't he? Um, did, did that come after Panini and so was were the, were the codification of emotions which, which is there in Navarasas which comes into dance and music, no, but, uh, was that much later? Codification of emotions is okay, but Pat Patanjali is not credited with that. No? No, 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 no. Uh, Patanjali, is, his work is called Mahabhashya. It is a commentary on the Vartikas that is the very first commentary on the Ashtadhyayi. Uh, Patanjali does not, does not directly comment on Ashtadhyayi. Okay. He comments on <coughs> the Vartikas of Katyayana, who is the first available commentator of Pandani. And Vartikas are quite similar to the Sutras. They are very short sentences. And what does a Vartikakara do? He simply either adds or suggests some changes or something like that. Isn't Patanjali credited with the Yoga Sutras and... Uh... Well, 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 there, there are three Patanjalis. <laughs> oh, I see, okay. Sometimes they say that it was the same, one and the same, but there is no unanimity of opinion about this. Okay, so the, the Navarasas would have been um, yes. codified... Uh, Bharata. Oh. It is Bharata who, who composed the text of Natya Shastra. He is the first to give you description of Navarasas. And that was before Panini? No. Uh, no. That was after Panini. After Panini. So, so Panini was the first person who attempted some codification of what you said about 
uh, happiness and content yeah, without emotions. Other <coughs> emotions, matching so, emotions with some linguistic elements, such as accent, tone. Is it possible, and this is just the way I'm trying to understand it, that just like everything is about complementarity and opposites, is it possible that Panini gave the structure, the brain, the logic, the left brain part of language, but the consciousness and the soul of language, the sacred language, was a different thread altogether. And together, they make up for the richness of Sanskrit. So the reason why Panini is so good for computational uh, machinistic understanding and the brevity and making it as short as possible is it, it's a very mathematical approach to it. Yes. But but um, like with language, there is there is the syntax of it and there's the poetry and the 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 soul and the consciousness of it, and maybe that part comes from the sacred Sanskrit, whereas this is the spoken Sanskrit, and together. They both make Sanskrit, you know, as special as it is. But maybe the spoken, um, the the sacred Sanskrit has the the emphasis on sound meanings and you know the bijakshara and word word meanings, which is not there in this part. Maybe he just needed to focus on this, so he made it simpler for himself by looking at the structure. But to get the entire picture of Sanskrit, you need that stream as well as the stream. Is the way. I'd I'd like to see it, I don't know. <laughs> First of all, you have to <clears throat> note that Panini did not write or compose, I should say, <laughs> grammar of spoken language alone. He also analyzed Vedic language, but not completely. He dealt with the peculiarities of Vedic language so far as they were different from the spoken language. He did not deal with Vedic lang language exhaustively because that was not his business. But he certainly gives quite a few rules which are known as Vaidika Sutra. And that is why, and, and in fact the Laukika spoken language rules also hold good for Vedic language. But Sacred not... language is not completely different from classical language. It has some differences, some deviations. But that doesn't mean that it was totally different. No. Because the fact is that all the Vedic commentators, commentators of Rugveda, Yajurveda, Atharvaveda, etc., they draw upon Panini. While interpreting the Vedic words, they cite Panini's sutras. You you'll read the commentaries and you will find off and on there is a mention of Iti Panini, they say. So they refer to Pandini's grammar because they have a full faith in Pandini's grammar as a Vedanga. It is treated as an ancillary text of Vedas. It's a sacred grammar. As say. a way of giving structure. Of uh, course, Pandini yeah. dealt with structure. He had yeah. nothing to do with the meaning and this, uh, you say, this uh, uh, Ram Rim room, etc. Actually, this Ram Rim room, they don't appear in Vedas. They don't appear in early Vedas. They come very late in Upanishads, and those Upanishads where they appear, they also belong to a very late period. You know, there are 300 Upanishads, but only 10 Upanishads are ancient or old Upanishads. So all these things, you know, Bijakshara, Mantras, etc., they belong to a very late period as compared to the Vedic language, uh, the sacred literature. Yeah, I think they would have... Pre Presuppose the need for a script and language. It, they couldn't have happened of course, without yes. that. Of so course. maybe that's why they came later. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. There was a lot of uh, development after the Vedas were composed and they were being recited. <clears throat> Even in the lines of ritual, this, all these things uh, uh, was introduced at a late stage in order to uh, hide something from common people. Bijakshara mantras. Again codifying. Yes. Yeah. They did not want to hand over some uh, vidya to general uh, public. They wanted to, these purohitas, for instance, they are blamed for that. Yeah. They wanted yes, to yeah. keep it to themselves. But that's again an aspect of codifying language, which Panini yes. also did. In yeah, a way. yeah. So yeah. codification, very common. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Later on, yeah. You can say. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> I'm sorry, this much I know about it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you again. Um, Thank you so again two asking. related questions. One is, that, so when you were talking about the machine, that it can be treated as a machine. So you, give, you gave the example of giving three words and what are the um, classifications you want. And the machine will give the thing. Uh, has it been shown or can it be shown that given any valid input, it will always give a terminated sentence? Or can it get stuck in a loop? You can try, certainly. I mean, even I can try it. But, but I have a full confidence. You give any Sanskrit sentence. Mm, Sanskrit, <laughs> yeah. Any valid input according to of the course. thing. It will always stop with a yes. sentence. Okay. If, you, if you give an... Uh, if you, oh, sorry. <laughs> If you give an unpardonian uh, sentence, it will just throw it away. <laughs> okay. I, but are there, in his rules, um, like does it say what, does he say what, what the invalid things are or is it just implied? Actually, they are generative rules. Okay. So you cannot feed the ready-made uh, sentences to the uh, input side. Mm -hmm. You have to give an input of the basic units and you have to ask the machine to generate. And what it generates is valid, correct Paninian sentences, which are usable in Sanskrit language. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think one, uh, in another talk, I think you, gave, you told about um, that people stick to this grammar so much that anything that's outside of his, if you write something that's outside of his rules, then people reject it. That's so right. the question is that, suppose I give a, a, a constructed word or a sentence, is it always possible to work out what the original roots and the things were yeah. unambiguously? Yes. Okay. Always. This is the business of the grammarians. Okay. Very favorite business. Okay. So, so, so any They engage themselves now, on finding out what is wrong and what is right. Okay. <laughs> and they feel very happy in finding out what is wrong with Kalidas, <laughs> for instance. <laughs> okay. But is that like, but in his thing, because it's generative, it's only one way. But you can also, can it easily be used to go the other way? No, the other way is uh, in the hands of the grammarians. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Pandani just gave the machine and he said, do whatever you want. <laughs> okay. So you mentioned that there are sutras, then vartika, and then... Uh, Mahabhashya. Mahabhashyas, yeah. So my question is, at every level, especially because these are in sutra form, sutra form at every level of interpretation, uh, there could be a possibility of ambiguity or loss of meaning or loss of uh, uh, understanding of what the actual author wanted to say. If we take Brahma Sutras as an example, as far as I understand, depending on the commentary, there are different schools of thought in Indian philosophy, right? So uh, similarly, in this case also, in the interpretation of uh, uh, Ashtadhyayi, do you see difference of opinion depending on who is commenting uh, on it? Or, or were they so perfect that there's no room for ambiguity? In the whole Parninian tradition, Patanjali is regarded... <laughs> in the whole Parninian grammatical tradition, Patanjali is regarded as the highest authority, highest even higher than Panini. Panini, Katyayana and Patanjali, together they are called Tri Muni. They are all the three sages. And therefore, Pandanian grammar is called Trimuni Vyakarana. But later tradition gave so much importance to Patanjali that they almost always said, Yat Patanjali hi aha tad asmakam pramanam. Beyond Patanjali, they never uh, did go anywhere. So even now recently, we are trying to find out where Patanjali went wrong. For instance, uh, Gaurav, my student, is sitting here. Uh, have you read my lectures on... Did you find time to go through my lectures on Paribhashan to Shekhara? So there, what we have done, this is an exercise we have done. We deciphered the whole text and I... Uh, there, there was a group of students and then I raised many questions about how can Patanjali interpret this word differently from he interprets it in this sutra. So there are many self-contradictions and Patanjali just leaves it unsolved quite often. So though Patanjali's Mahabharata has its own greatness, it has its own shortcomings also. And they, the whole later tradition, till 17th, 18th century, they never paid any attention to the faults because they, they found 
in patanjali uh, aditi they worship patanjali like anything there is a saying yathottaram muninam pramanyam panini katyayana and patanjali patanjali is highest katyayana higher and panini poor fellow is just high panini provided they provided just material he kept quiet and these two fellows they build their own theories on that and uh, well they are well known <clears throat> uh, and just to follow up uh, what are the research areas in vyakarana in today's time like the the projects that you give out to your students what are the kind of uh, research projects that you you can compare this emotive meanings psychology and as she said <coughs> neurological uh, uh, you know matching of phonemes and uh, their meanings there are quite a few and there is so so much scope for comparison all the panini uh, non panini systems and panini system there is a lot of scope for comparison thank you <clears throat> and once you uh, read panini you will find many more things yourself for search uh, so one example you gave uh, this is a simple question uh, that bhratruvya bhratruvya so can you show us the different ways it can be said and how the uh, when how is the swarita how is the udatta anudatta I, i can just try but i am not sure whether my uh, way of pronunciation is correct That's because it is the vaidikas who can really pronounce udatta anudatta swarita and even these tones huh. correctly bhratruvya hmm. bhratruvya mm hmm this is the difference so the difference of stress maybe okay great uh thank you for that and uh, okay i have but i am not sure whether in panini's time it was pronounced like this maybe differently <laughs> so this is the difficulty that i find i mean uh, understanding even in vedas okay how to how to really say it correctly so there are people i mean there are uh, vedics i mean the the schools are there where they must be teaching it for but for a lay person like me it becomes a challenge no actually uh, that is not the case mm -hmm. the recitation of vedas is perfect the same uniform everywhere, everywhere you go throughout you go. india because so it I has it has come down to us it. through oral tradition mm. and centuries of recitation yeah but it has been written isn't it closed i mean uh, so uh, see i i may not really be following any rituals okay uh -huh. but can i go and learn i mean is it is it possible that is a uh, challenge these uh, yeah the recitation yeah yes, not of course it is not that easy it's not that easy you are lucky to you are lucky to find a guru i was lucky to find so huh. the gurus that teach women as well so okay. you have to go to the guru that teaches women not all of them ha huh. Okay okay great I'll, I'll check with you. I can narrate you my own experience which is true mm hmm in 1962 mm. how many years ago just count mm. uh, <coughs> around my six, own 61. guru mm. who taught me vyakarana mm. uh, he thought that this girl should learn vedic act, uh, recitation also yeah so he he was a kind of a uh, very forward looking person though he was uh, traditionally trained he wanted his student his girl student to be able to recite vedas mm. which was completely tabooed mm. during that period but he found out one vaidika mm. who was as forward as he was okay. and then he sent me to that mm. vaidika mm. and i sat through and uh, i learned with great difficulty of course we had had you know, to sit for several sittings for one sukta mm. it went on for a year okay and then there was some function going on in the institute where the where my guru was teaching <clears throat> and my guru said uh, you make uh, you recite your vedic mangala today mm. in the assembly mm. so i stood up as you are standing up before the mic <laughs> and there were people were sitting and uh, my uh, teacher said come on and they started saying no 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 woman reciting we will not stay here mm. we will not listen if she recites a vedic mantra mm. then what happened i tell you 
Do you know the famous historian of Maharashtra, Datto Vaman Poddar? Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you have heard his name, but he was a yes. very well-known historian. <clears throat> he also was another very forward-looking person. Mm -hmm. He was the uh, chairperson of that function. <clears throat> then he took the mic in his hands and he said, this girl will recite Veda. Those who don't want to listen, leave the hall. Mm -hmm. Those who agree, sit down. Then I recited. Mm, wow. <laughs> this is a story, and this I think this continues even into today. Yeah. But a lot, lot has changed. It has changed, of course, to some extent. Mm. They are, yeah, they are learning. But there are uh, you know traditional pundits, some traditional pundits yes. in some mm. pockets, you can say. Yeah. So uh, my second, it's more of a comment. So you said that he was working on this uh, making of all these 3,994 sutras for 12 years or so. So for this is studying, studying. the language. So he must have collected a lot of words. And without writing, it seems quite difficult, I feel. I mean, there has to be uh, some kind of a diagram or some, he must have done. I mean, this is just my guess. OK, we are not finding it because it must have been on some perishable material. So it's possible. And another comment was related to the place where he was, okay, because he was near Peshawar, uh, uh, Pushkalavati, so that, that area, uh, Lahur, Lahur, you say. So from the West, uh, there, were, there are a lot of examples that we are finding of ancient inscriptions. It must not, I mean, it may not have been in Brahmi necessarily. <coughs> it could have been Kharoshti, it could have been something from Persian side. Uh, so that is just a guess uh, that I have. And uh, <coughs> lastly, I just want to ask a, a last question. So I'm a historian, and what kind of historic uh, uh, things we can derive, okay, so uh, claims we can find from uh, these sutras? So maybe you can throw some light uh, <coughs> uh, on that, okay? Uh, for example, maybe the currency, or it could be the social uh, <coughs> structure or life. Uh, kind of things. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> so as far as uh, the use of script by Panani, well, uh, everybody can guess. Uh, it's only a guesswork. And uh, <clears throat> we really feel that it, was, it must have been utterly impossible for Panani to just keep in his mind all those millions and millions of words and sentences, work upon them, unless he had some kind of a graph or some kind of uh, script. Uh, anyway, in the absence of any material, but uh, again, absentia cannot be regarded as a as a concrete proof. So could be there, but we don't have a record. Huh? And uh, your uh, last question. Uh, Historic. Yeah. His, oh well, there are some books on uh, India as reflected in Panini's grammar. So about social life and coins and status of women and everything. And what we find is that the same old Vedic religion continued during Pandani's time. But only one thing which I would like to stress is that women also were speaking Sanskrit along with men. Later on, you know, historians want to, uh, want to show that they were not allowed. And they were indeed not allowed in the later period. But during Pandini's time, they must have been, because there are quite a few words which come from kitchen. So in an article, I, I uh, wrote that unless the woman was speaking in Sanskrit, you cannot justify the presence of words from the kitchen. Uh, you know, there are uh, cooking, uh, frying, deep frying, baking, mixing, all kinds of things, you know, this whole culinary <coughs> thing you can find in Pandani's grammar. And then if you don't accept it, then you have to accept that men were working, uh, were working in the kitchen. Which of the two you like? Uh, mine is a very brief question. I was just wondering, um, there's a lot of studies these days on the effects of Sanskrit. There's a lot of studies these days on the effects of Sanskrit on the human brain the neurological effects, the neuron connections and everything. I just wondered if you could shed some light on that and also if Panini's grammar 
and its effects on the mind, the biology of the human body has made any headway because people are now saying that all the swaras, etc., do have also that impact on you. So just wondering. Thank you. First of all, I am not a neurologist. I don't have, I haven't studied any of these, uh, you know, things in my life. But as far as I am concerned, I don't know, but people uh, around me, they always say that uh, uh, my speech is something very uh, unique and quite different from other how other people say. And uh, I, I really feel greatly delighted <laughs> when I speak, when I recite Sanskrit, and that gives me joy. Another thing, really if you recite even Sanskrit Subhashitas for that matter, let alone the Vedic mantras, you recite just one sarga from Kalidasa and you will certainly find it must be some kind of you know secretions in your brain. I'm sure. Because, because the uh, dhvani of Sanskrit is a, uh, how they call it? Nada, nada madhur, but the sonorous language. Sanskrit is sonorous language. So this sonority which is a feature, striking feature of Sanskrit must be having some uh, pleasant effect on your brain. I was just thinking in terms of the layers to this grammar. I think this is one... Grammar, I don't think. No, no. no. I don't think. You can but just best, uh, better understand the language. But the mantras, their recitation, that is something very different. <coughs> uh, <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for uh, the lecture. Uh, so I, I am from sort of a cognitive science background. So I, I'm very, very intrigued by the, uh, not only analysis part, but also the synthesis part of uh, the Ashtadhyayi. So in, in cognitive science and in AI, we basically talk about synthesizing programs. So you take some base programs and you combine them to co create more complex programs. <coughs> so what, what I'm very curious about is, um, in the history since Parini, uh, there were obviously uh, relations between things and objects which did not exist during Panini's time. Yes. So did, were the synthesis rules used to describe these new things uh, after Panini? And are there like historical records for this happening? Uh, and my follow-up then on that is, could, does he also describe how things in the future could then be described? Things which don't exist today, how could they be described in the future using those same rules? So yeah, that's, that's my question. Whatever new came up after Panini, it was the, <coughs> uh, what should I, secret duty, it was regarded as a secret duty as his commentators. They took the task upon themselves and they added those words, those expressions to Panini's grammar in the form of Vartikas or Mahabhashya, even Mahabhashya statements. And they said these words need to be added, these expressions need to be added. Just in order, their main purpose was to show that Panini's grammar is a complete, exhaustive treatment of language. Therefore, whatever was lacking in Panini's grammar from the later point of view, they added it. But Panini didn't uh, provide anything for future. <laughs> oh no, the synthesis of the word, for instance, say steam engine. So steam engine would not have existed during. Oh, sorry. <coughs> The steam engine would not have existed during Panini's time. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, is there a rule to describe what a steam engine does? I am afraid, no. <laughs> sentence, but, uh, you know, there, there are some uh, very adamant commentators of Panini. They will try to find out somehow that, yes, there is a word. And you, you can derive it with the help of Panini. Yeah. But that is, you know, uh, a very difficult uh, way of... Just one? Allow only last last one. Just the word. Just the word bratra. You said brother. Um, the concept of brotherhood. Was there anything in his language that dealt with the abstraction of the concept of brotherhood as opposed to bratra, meaning brother, son of brother? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> Uh, very uh, insightful talk. Thank you for that. Uh, so you mentioned that linguistic uh, automism that 
uh, the sentences have been broken down by Panini into words. So words are not actually the basic form. The alphabets are the base. So no. how do we use this? Word? On the meaning so level, no. Uh, On the so meaning level, it's not alphabets. It's the prakriti and pratyaya, huh. the stem and the suffix. Okay. So now if we have to understand or get the meaning of the alphabet, so like the philology, so basically the word uh, is etymology, if we study the study of that, and if you have to work on the philology part of it, understanding the alphabet meaning. So has Panini gone into that depth after the words, into the philology part and tried to oh, bring out meanings of each <coughs> alphabet to construct the word and then to the sentences? No, 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 no. That, I, I have already explained yeah, this but point. I wanted this atomism to uh, be, I mean, uh, some clarity on that. Atomism is on two levels. I already said it. On phonetic level and on morphemic level. So on morphemic level, there are two atoms, Prakriti and Pratyaya. And on phonetic level, there are those nine swaras and 25 or whatever consonants. So they are on phonetic level. Panini never talks about any meaning of them. He never bothers to uh, find out if they really convey any meaning. No. They are simply phonetic atoms. Thank you for this very lively and, if I may say, progressive talk on Panini and Sanskrit. My question is actually much more broad. Uh, what, according to you, is actually the most beautiful, elegant, or poetic in Sanskrit? Beautiful poetry? No, what, what do you find the most poetic part of Sanskrit? As a language, what, what do you find most beautiful in it? It is the sonority it? of the language, basically. So, so dhvani carries a lot of meaning in Sanskrit. Meter, there is a kind of a rhythm to the language. Even when somebody speaks in the prose, there is some kind of a rhythm. So these are the two features, according to me, which have added to a lot of a poetic element to Sanskrit. Thank you. And that has been uh, actually acknowledged all over the world. That is why they call Sanskrit is a beautiful language, they say. I met a Pakistani fellow on board of my, my, my flight somewhere, I don't remember. He was just sitting by my side and we were just sharing, uh, discussing what are you doing, what I am doing, etc. So I, I told him I am a student of Sanskrit. He said, oh, Om, such a beautiful language. <laughs> that was his expression. So when a Pakistani fellow praises Sanskrit because of the sonority, Therein lies the beauty. On behalf of the MC, the director, the program committee, I just want to extend a very warm thanks to Dr. Bhatti. Not only for the three sessions which she's repeated over and over is not enough to unpack Panini or Sanskrit, but for her candor as well as for all the effort that she put into the slides and also in rescheduling her visit to come to BIC and deliver this masterclass. And thank you to so many of you who've come back over the three days. Uh, hope to bring you more sessions like this. And again, a huge thanks to Dr. Dr. Bhatti. No, in fact, before we close the session, let me thank all of you. Raviji, who gave me this opportunity to share my views on Panini with such an august audience, very intelligent people I see around me for the first time in my life. <laughs> because such question-answer sessions I never met earlier. I gave several times, I gave lectures on Panini. But no, unfortunately, even in Pune, my own workplace. So, Raviji, Many, many thanks to you. for uh, You actually had to bear on with me for all kinds of... <laughs> it was worth it, And it was then Saraswati ji, Sandhya ji, and uh, also Gauri and Pratiti ji, above all. Yeah, she was with me the whole day yesterday, uh, showing places around and, yeah, playing host to me. So thanks to all and above all, thanks to all of you. Thank yes, you. I will always remember these three days.